As the floodwaters in Mississippi finally begin to recede tonight, an even greater danger left behind in its wake. This is the scene in Jackson, a city of more than 180,000 people. Residents there lining up in their cars, look at that, for hours, trying to get their hands on the most basic necessity, clean water. Officials warning the city's supply, it's just unsafe to drink or even brush your teeth with. And the pressure in the pipe so low, the governor warns it won't be enough to fight fires. The issue stemming from this plant, which has been a cause of concern in the state for years. Many residents had already been under a boil notice for weeks. When widespread flooding turned an already dire situation into a catastrophe, the Pearl River, you see it here, rising to dangerous levels and completely paralyzing the water delivery system. NBC's Guad Venegas is on the ground there in Mississippi and leads us off tonight. Tonight, a race to distribute water in Jackson, Mississippi. Cars lined up for miles outside distribution centers full of locals hoping for water who left empty-handed after the supply quickly ran out. Water that they are giving, well, you can't get to it because the line be so damn long. For weeks, Jackson residents have been under a boil water notice put in place last month because of contaminated water concerns. Now they're on the brink of having no water at all. The uh, water pressure has been low. So Taprice Young has been spending $100 a week on water for her family. We've had to boil water to cook, to wash dishes, you know, pretty much to brush our teeth. State officials say flood water complications impacted storage tanks, pumps, and water flow, resulting in a failure at Jackson's main plant. The lack of water was due to pressure, a lack of pressure in the system. The water is not safe to drink, and I would even say it's not safe to brush your teeth with. Today, the governor declaring a new state of emergency, announcing a total or near total loss of water pressure throughout the city and surrounding areas. The city cannot produce enough water to fight fires, to reliably flush toilets, and to meet other critical needs. The state now preparing for the colossal challenge of distributing water to 180,000 people in and around Jackson. How long can the city operate without running water, distributing water the way you're planning to do? I mean, this isn't sustainable. We're going to go with this emergency plan as long as we have to. All right, as long as they have to. Guad Venegas joins us now live from Brandon, Mississippi. Guad, I guess the first question is how long do leaders estimate it will take to get those pumps working at a level that is acceptable for a city in the U.S.? Tom, we don't know. Some of the explanations that have been given by state authorities would require an engineer to understand exactly how much water is necessary for a city the size of Jackson, right? There's too many technicalities. What we do know, you know, today we finally spend time in the community knocking on doors and talking to people. What we do know is that the water pressure isn't there for most people. Some people have waters, other have very little water. And the people here tell me this isn't new. This is something they've been dealing with for a long time. So what we know is that the day that that water pressure is back, the day that they announce that people can drink the water, that's the day that it'll be acceptable for a city like Jackson. But right now, we don't know when that day will come because they keep preparing to bring in water, get the National Guard to help out, and keep distributing uh, the water. Yeah. They did say that they expect things to improve here, Tom, but we still don't know how long it's going to take for that water service to be restored. Right, right. It's a big unknown here. So, so Guad, we're talking about more than 150,000 residents. How are they getting the word out that the water is not safe to drink? Well, Tom, as I mentioned, the people here have been dealing with this for a long time. So for us from outside of Mississippi, this is news, right? For, for the people here, they've been dealing with this for a very long time. They know that they can't drink the water in Jackson. You saw the mother saying that she spends $100 a week to get the drinking water for her family over the weekend. She had to shower at a friend's place because they didn't have enough water for that. So the people here just know that this is the way they have to live, and they don't understand why the city can't fix the issue. We know that now that the state has intervened. They are bringing additional resources. And when I asked the mayor, well, what could fix the problem? Why hasn't this problem been fixed in the past? He said, well, there's a lot of things with the infrastructure. We're trying to fix them one at a time. I said, okay, give me a solution. What would fix this problem? And he said, well, I wouldn't be opposed to a whole new plant, which would cost about a billion dollars. So right now they're doing what they can to restore the service. But of course, it's going to be challenging, Tom.
Guad Venegas leading us off tonight. That community there in Mississippi continuing to clean up as they deal with that water crisis as heat alerts expand across the West and thunderstorms take aim at millions. For more on the forecast, I want to bring in NBC meteorologist Dylan Dreyer. So, Dylan, walk us through these thunderstorms you're watching right now. There's a lot going on. You know, down through Mississippi, down along the Gulf Coast states, we have the ground completely saturated, and any additional rain is just going to cause more flooding, or at least the threat of more flooding. And we did have some thunderstorms move through Mississippi, also down just north of New Orleans. We have a lot of cloud-to-ground lightning falling as well. This is all part of the same storm system that's impacting the Northeast. It's not as severe in the Northeast. We're not getting reports of a lot of wind or hail, but we are getting some lightning and also some heavier downpours, and these will continue to move eastward as we go through the night, and then it's gone. Tomorrow's a much better day, lower humidity too. The big story is then going to become the heat out west. We are looking at some of the hottest temperatures we've seen all season. We have heat warnings, heat watches, heat advisories in effect for 52 million people. And yes, it's hot right now, but it's only going to get hotter. In fact, Sunday, Monday could be some of the hottest temperatures we've seen so far. We'll likely break some records tomorrow with a high in Yakima of 101. That should break the record of 97 degrees. Missoula, 101. That would break the record of 94. And then as we go through the weekend, temperatures will be ex- exceptionally hot. Look at Sacramento, 110 on Saturday, 112 on Sunday and Monday. Fresno will be up around 108 degrees. Even Los Angeles, it's only every couple of years that they even hit 100 degrees, and we should hit a high of about 100 degrees on Sunday. And again, this will last through at least Tuesday, Tom. It's going okay. to stay hot. I know you guys are tracking that heat wave, and that those those temperatures are pretty incredible. Talk to me about the tropics, too, because you guys are monitoring some stuff there. Interesting. It's a La Nina year. Usually we tend to see uh, the tropics be pretty active, but we haven't had any named storms in August so far. We do have a storm system that has an 80% chance of developing into perhaps a tropical depression, but still, we don't have much time left in August to get that named storm in, and I don't think that is going to happen. We also have another storm off the coast of Africa. Uh, We've only gone through three names so far this season, Alex, Bonnie, and Colin. So next storm would be Danielle uh, as we just slowly move through this list. That's a good thing. We don't need a very active hurricane season, but just to put this into perspective, It's been 59 days since we've had the last named storm. Again, that was Colin. And the last time we did not have any named storms in August was back in 1997, so 25 years ago. And again, it is a La Nina year, so we do typically uh, tend to see a lot more activity in the Atlantic. But for right now, things are mostly quiet, but things could take a turn as we go through September and the temperatures continue to warm up in the oceans. Tom. Today, President Biden addressing the gun violence crisis during a speech in the battleground state of Pennsylvania. The president once again saying he is determined to ban assault weapons. Here's Gabe Gutierrez with more on the nationwide debate. Today in Philadelphia, yet another bullet riddled car. A father shot dead at a gas station. A 14 and 10 year old survived. Little more than 100 miles away, President Biden defended his record on crime ahead of this year's midterms. When it comes to public safety in this nation, the answer is not defund the police, it's fund the police. His administration's plan to curb gun violence includes $13 billion over the next five years to hire more police officers, $3 billion to help courts clear backlogs, and a 13 percent increase in the ATF's budget for new investigators to help cities trace firearms and analyze ballistics. The president also hoping to build on federal gun safety legislation Congress passed earlier this summer. I'm determined to ban assault weapons in this country. He's also calling out the GOP lawmakers who've suggested defunding the FBI following the search of former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. There's no place in this country, no place, for endangering the lives of law enforcement. Republicans are blaming Democrats and lenient prosecutors for the crime surge. We need to be more concerned with helping the victims of crime than in placating the perpetrators of crime. During the pandemic, firearm-related injuries nationwide rose 34 percent, deaths 28 percent. In New York City, shootings also spiked during COVID but are still much less frequent than in the 1970s. How does crime now in New York City compare to what it was back then? It's not comparable. That's when Curtis Sliwa first organized a volunteer group called the Guardian Angels to patrol subways and neighborhoods. You're beginning to see that we're receding back to a point where there was lawlessness and anarchy. All right, Gabe joins us from Times Square tonight. Uh, Gabe, talk to us about the gun debate that's happening and specifically what's happening in New York that is on the radar of a lot of people, including law enforcement. 
Uh, yeah, that's right, Tom. Now, a new law is set to take effect on Thursday, prohibiting firearms in so-called sensitive areas like Times Square. Now, this all comes after the Supreme Court struck down earlier this summer concealed carry restrictions in New York State. The governor and state lawmakers passed their own law saying that certain areas will be restricted, like courthouses, public transportation, and Times Square. The question is, though, for local officials, Tom, what exactly are the boundaries of Times Square? They're discussing it at a city council meeting later tonight. And again, this new law takes effect on Thursday. Tom? Gabe Gutierrez from Times Square. Now to alarming news out of Texas we're following tonight. We've been reporting on monkeypox for weeks. Now, a patient diagnosed with monkeypox has died. It's the first known death in the U.S. from the virus. And Houston health officials say the person was severely immunocompromised. It comes as monkeypox cases are still slowly rising across the U.S. Dr. Amish Adalja joins us now. He's an infectious disease expert and senior scholar at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Dalja, health officials said they're, they're piecing together the role that monkeypox might have played in this patient's death without knowing the specifics of this person's health history. Based off what we do know, though, about monkeypox, how concerned are, are you about this one case? I'm not very concerned. It's obviously tragic when anybody dies, but I think we need to look, know a lot more about this case, what type of immunocompromise the patient had. Uh, was monkeypox something that the patient was diagnosed with? Were they treated with antivirals? Did they have central nervous system or brain infection complications? All of that's going to be important to understand it, but we, I think we have to take the full context of about 14,000 or so cases in the United States with one death in an immunocompromised individual, that I think is very reassuring that this is not a very lethal disease as we've seen outside the endemic countries. We've also seen more reports of pediatric monkeypox cases, including a case in Gwinnett County, Georgia, and another in New York City from what I understand as well. H how are kids getting this? Do we, do we know yet? It's likely that they are in contact with an individual in their household that has monkeypox. We know that close contacts, whether they be sexual or whether they be household contacts, are at risk. And this is going to be something that we see with 14,000 cases. There's going to be some cases and individuals that have household contact. And that's why it's important to get vaccine into the at-risk population, get vaccine into those who are exposed that's going to be key, but this isn't going to be something that spreads through the pediatric population, for example, the way COVID-19 did. All right, Dr. Amish, we appreciate it. We want to head overseas now to the deadly unrest in Baghdad's green zone. Armed forces clashing with protesters who are now armed with weapons, including grenade launchers. It's the worst violence seen in Iraq's capital city in years. Julie Serkin has those details. Overnight, deadly violence in Baghdad culmination of the long-running power struggle between rival Shiite groups and political tension as Iraq's leaders remain deadlocked on forming a government. Powerful cleric Muqtada al sadere is using the country's capital as his front line, armed supporters taking to the streets, firing rifles and rocket launchers. After al sadere threatened to resign from politics, protesters loyal to al sadere breaching the government palace gates, Toppling cement barriers, gunfire rippling through the streets. That led to the deaths of at least 30 people, according to the Associated Press. But tonight... The Iraqi Shiite leader calling for an end to the unrest. The violence and eventual retreat proving al Sadr's influence. <laughs> and the reality that danger could soon strike again. In Iraqi Arabic, it's Allah Ayam, which means may God never bring back those days. Al said that it emerged as a symbol of resistance against the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, using nationalist rhetoric steeped in religion to win over some of Iraq's most impoverished and unemployed populations. Legal sociologist Ruba al Hasseni specializes in Iraq relations, and she knows all too well that this is far from over. What does this kind of violence and turmoil do to everyday citizens in Iraq? It creates a culture of fear. 
And a new election could still take place to determine which party will take control of the embattled region. Many Iraqis have lost faith in this election and the electoral system. So who's going to hold who uh, accountable? But for now, peace in the green zone. At least now some Iraqis can breathe because last night was very frightening for many people. And you can tell from those images, Julie Serkin joins us now live in studio. So, Julie, you know, I think a lot of people haven't heard about the Green Zone in Baghdad since the war, but there are still a lot of Americans there and diplomats. What's the concern for them? Yeah, look, the State Department has not changed its posture since all this violence ensued, but they have continued warning citizens from traveling to Iraq and especially to the Green Zone. Other neighboring countries to Iraq, like Iran, actually saying the same kind of message, trying to warn citizens from coming there. Netherlands, however, pulling out their embassy staff altogether. Of course, this violence may have ended overnight, but it is far from over. Okay, Julie Serkin for us here on Top Story. First time in studio. Great to have you, Julie. Thank you. All right, the world also mourning the passing of a political giant. Tonight, Mikhail Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union who oversaw the end of the Cold War, has died at the age of 91. Andrea Mitchell covered him for years and has a look back at how his time in power shaped the world. Mikhail Gorbachev, the communist leader whose brief six-year reign transformed the map of Europe and the world. The first Soviet leader with a larger vision for his country and who was willing to hold a summit with Ronald Reagan, the American president who called the Soviet Union an evil empire. Little did Gorbachev know he would preside over the end of that empire, years later saying, we could and should have saved the Soviet Union, but we lost politically. The two men clashed famously at their next meeting in Reykjavik, Iceland. But by December of 1987, partly through the influence of Nancy Reagan on her husband, they were at the White House, signing a treaty to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons. The same year, Gorbachev gave his first American television interview to NBC's Tom Brokaw. And by the next year, a return summit in Moscow. The two were walking arm in arm in Red Square. And later, Gorbachev let the Berlin Wall come down without sending in Russian tanks, for which he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. Americans were charmed by this new kind of young Soviet leader with his ideas of glasnost and perestroika, openness and economic restructuring, and his very modern wife, Raisa. But back home, his Kremlin colleagues tried to overturn him in a three-day coup and failed. Gorbachev returned from house arrest in Crimea to find Russian President Boris Yeltsin in charge and soon resigned. He said to avoid a bloody civil war in a country saturated with nuclear weapons. Mikhail Gorbachev, the man who changed the world but could not save his own country from falling apart. And tonight, Andrea joins us now live from Washington. Andrea, you met and interviewed Gorbachev and covered him for a number of years. What was your impression of him as a leader? Well, he was transformational. There's no question about that, Tom. When the two men, Reagan and Gorbachev, first met, think of this. Gorbachev was the Soviet leader, the communist leader, and he was meeting Ronald Reagan, who called the Soviet Union an evil empire. And, and still, they managed to change so many things. They managed to reach nuclear arms weapons treaties, treaties to reduce nuclear weapons by the two superpowers. And in Reykjavik, when they disagreed very angrily, they still patched it up the next year and actually signed one of those treaties. So the fact that they did so much together to change the world and that he had so many interesting ideas about glasnost, openness, and perestroika, redoing the Soviet economy, he knew there was a rottenness at, the, at its core, but he didn't have the ability to get one step farther and think of taking down the, the, the empire so he didn't get beyond communism. So he didn't see the promised land, if you will. That was uh, Yeltsin. But he did do something so terribly important, as we pointed out in the piece. When the Berlin Wall came down, no one knew that there would not be Soviet tanks. And in fact, there weren't. The order was no bullets would be fired. And we had those incredible images you know, of Tom Brokaw live for nightly news in front of the Berlin Wall, the only American broadcaster and all of those Germans climbing onto the wall and popping champagne uh, and, you know, cutting pieces of the wall out. It was, it was just an amazing period. It transformed Europe and really, you know, the, the world as we know it. You know, Andrew, you, Vladimir Putin. you got to see those, those historical events up close. As somebody who was growing up in Miami, Cuban-American, we followed news out of Cuba and Russia so closely. Right. This was such a momentous time in the late 80s and early 90s. As somebody who, who's covered foreign policy, are, are you surprised at 
where Russia was at one point when Gorbachev was stepping down and where Russia is today under Vladimir Putin? No, absolutely. And Gorbachev did not have the vision. He did not want to give up Ukraine, for instance. He did not see it as an independent country. So he was a Soviet leader. But I had, you know, as a kid reporter, gone, you know, in one of my first assignments in 1967 and saw Kosygin. And, you know, we saw what happened with Brezhnev. And we once asked Reagan why he hadn't met with any of these Soviet leaders, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernyenko. And he said, well, they all keep dying on me because they were all old men. Gorbachev was 54 when he took over. And just two years later was meeting with Ronald Reagan and so much younger than Reagan. And uh, still, they orchestrated it, the White House, so that Reagan looked like the youthful one when they first met in Geneva. It was all remarkable. But when I'm thinking about your analogy about growing up in Cuba, in Miami, and, and what happened in Cuba, it was after the Cold War ended that, of course, the Soviets stopped propping up you know, stop the Castro regime, up the, yeah. The, the, the whole regime in Havana, and that's when the economic collapse happened in Havana um, to this day. And changed a lot of countries throughout Latin America. Andrea Mitchell, we thank you for your time and your, your reflection on, on, on what was an incredible historical leader, someone we will never forget. Thank you for that. For more on the life and legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev, I want to bring in Robert English. He's the director of Central European Studies at the University of Southern California. He's also the author of three books on Gorbachev. Robert, you met Gorbachev four times. How did he come to realize that that communism was not the way forward, at least communism the way he had lived it? Because a lot of times communism indoctrinates its people. So to break free is quite difficult. Um, how was he able to see beyond that, to see that the Soviet Union, that, that, that there was no more future there? I think the first important juncture was that he grew up mainly in the post-Stalin world. Right. He was a little boy at the time of World War II. His region was actually occupied for a while by the Germans. It was traumatic. It was disruptive. But then the post-war reality set in. Stalin died. He went off to college in Moscow and was exposed to remarkable, diverse currents of the so-called thaw epic under Khrushchev, if you remember Nikita Khrushchev, who opened the country a little bit to the world, who really, who relaxed some of the censorship. And it was a time of enormous ferment, especially in Moscow, especially in institutions of higher education where he was studying. That was the first eye-opening, the first change that set him apart from his um, predecessors. And, and so it's kind of interesting because he's going to be remembered in America one way, right? I think by a lot of Americans, but he's remembered in Russia much differently, correct? That's absolutely true. We remember him as the partner of Ronald Reagan in ending the Cold War and properly credit. In fact, maybe we don't even give him enough credit for his role in ending that Cold War because he, you know, he faced much fiercer opposition and had to transform his country very radically to meet Reagan halfway, which he did. But in his own country, he's remembered as the guy who started these reforms that unraveled everything and brought down a great superpower and uh, led to a decade of corruption, chaos, and poverty in the 90s, which Andrea Mitchell correctly pointed out is really properly blamed on his successor, right? He brought Russia to the promised land in a sense um, and then it was up to his successors what they did with those freedoms. Yeah, Russia almost changed too fast, and it led to an error that still exists of, of all that corruption. I do want to ask you, his death is coming at a really critical time for Russia, right, and what we're seeing with Ukraine and things he was sort of leading the way into undoing, now trying to put back together, as we see with Vladimir Putin. What did Vladimir Putin and Mikhail Gorbachev think of each other? I think that initially, like many of us, um, there was some admiration for Putin in the beginning of the 2000s because he um, brought some order to this chaos. The country was literally falling apart. And Putin, with a firm hand, brought things under control and actually pushed through some important liberalizing economic reforms. Don't forget, he was man of the year. He was widely praised in Forbes magazine, The Wall Street Journal, for his market reforms. But then increasingly, he turned more and more authoritarian, and Gorbachev began criticizing him because Gorbachev's chief legacy was glasnost, openness, and having democratized the system. And Gorbachev sadly watched year after year 
as Putin took away those freedoms. And the real poignancy with his dying now is that I guess Putin killed his last child in a sense that democracy's gone, those liberties are pretty much gone, and now peace with the West is gone as well. Robert English, a Gorbachev expert. Robert, we really appreciate your time. We also want to thank Andrea for that look back. Still ahead tonight, the deadly nursing home accident. You won't believe this. A resident dying after drinking what they thought was grape juice. You will not believe what it actually was. What officials say was in that cup. Plus, fugitive captured where the feds just tracked down a former Marine wanted for murder after six years on the run. And the moment a bull got loose at a rodeo in Florida, the cowboy who rode in to save the day. Top story, just getting started. Stay with us. All right, we're back now with one of the FBI's most wanted, captured after years on the run. The former Marine accused of murdering his girlfriend in San Diego in 2016, taken into custody in El Salvador. Authorities are now crediting the victim's mother for his capture. NBC Stephen Romo explains. Tonight, a Marine on the U.S. Marshal's top 15 most wanted list is in custody after allegedly killing his girlfriend in San Diego and fleeing to Mexico six years ago. Raymond McLeod, also known as RJ, was finally arrested in El Salvador this week. The U.S. Marshal Service saying local authorities took him into custody after they got a tip that McLeod was working as an English teacher at a nearby school. I was like, it's him! Oh my God, it's him! It is him! It just hit me all of a sudden. And he's even wearing his combat boots on. The 37-year-old was wanted by San Diego police since June of 2016, when officers were called to an apartment complex for reports of a woman who was not breathing, finding signs of a struggle when they got there. First responders found 30-year-old Crystal Mitchell, a mother of two, dead at the scene. Crystal's mother, Josephine, is a former police detective who called on those investigative skills to help find McLeod. I just turned pain into power. The San Diego District Attorney says she's generated leads and has been instrumental in helping authorities search. She even started a group called Angels of Justice to help other families in similar situations. I miss Crystal so much. Her laughter still rings in my ears. And as a matter of fact, when we caught up to McLeod, I could hear her laughing, just bellowing out that laughter like, Mom, you did it. You got it. Our attempts to reach McLeod's family were unsuccessful. Law enforcement experts saying this case is unusual due to the amount of time McLeod was on the run. I absolutely do think his military training played a role. Uh, For one, he was trained extensively on how to evade people that are looking for him, such as, um, you know, opposing military uh, forces. Um, And for two, he probably has a lot more street smarts and awareness of how to use resources in his environment. The San Diego District Attorney issued a statement saying, quote, This defendant's brazen attempt to evade justice is over, and the work to hold him accountable in a court of law for the murder of Crystal Mitchell can now begin. The DA also saying McLeod has a history of violence with previous partners. Now that he's in custody, U.S. Marshals Director Ronald Davis saying in a statement, quote, it is our sincere hope that his capture brings some sense of relief to Crystal Mitchell's family, especially her mother, Josephine Wenzel, who has worked so diligently with law enforcement these past years to see this day of justice arrive. I don't want people to think that they have to be former investigators to fight for justice. It's the mother in me that fought for justice. Incredible work by that mom right there. Stephen Romo joins us now on set. And Steve, we were just talking about this. One of the sad parts of all this story is that that person, the suspect now in custody, he actually had a history of violence. Yeah, from what we know, at least two that authorities are telling us about. One of them happened in Arizona in 2009. He was put on probation in order to complete domestic violence counseling. And then in 2016, just months before Crystal was killed, he was charged with injuring his spouse in Riverside, California. And for that, he pleaded not guilty and was granted bail, which he was still out on when Crystal was found dead. Authorities say he then fled after that time. A history of domestic violence. That's terrible. Okay, Stephen, we thank you. Coming up, fueling Russia's war. Despite tough sanctions from the U.S. and Europe, guess what? Vladimir Putin making even more money than ever on oil. So where is that cash flow coming from? We'll break it down next.
All right, we are back now with Top Stories News. We begin with a deadly accident at an assisted living home in California. Officials say residents were mistakenly served dishwashing liquid instead of grape juice. At least one woman killed and two others hospitalized. The facility says the employees involved have been suspended. That site has faced multiple negligence lawsuits over the past few years. Okay, now to a close call caught on camera at a rodeo in Tampa. Take a look. New video showing the bull escape from its pen before running towards the crowd and jumping into the stands. After a few minutes, a cowboy on horseback was able to lasso the animal and bring it back to the pen. Luckily, nobody was injured. And former President Trump's app, Truth Social, will not be available for Android users. Google Play says the app violates their standards for user-generated content moderation. Trump's media company launched the Twitter competitor after he was banned from the social media site. It was supposed to be available for Android users this month. Okay, we want to head now to Ukraine, where a team of U.N. inspectors met with President Zelensky in Kyiv ahead of a visit to an embattled nuclear plant. While in the south, Ukrainian forces are pressing on with a major counteroffensive. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald is there for us. Tonight, the battlefield is shifting, and Ukraine says it's on the attack. Fresh artillery strikes on the front line, a counteroffensive trying to take back Russian-held territory in the south. Ukrainian President Zelensky saying he won't give specific details about the mission. Russia says they've repelled the Ukrainian attack. While in the east, new Russian strikes in Kharkiv killing five people, injuring seven, and leaving a massive crater in the square. It comes as two U.S. officials tell NBC News that Russia is getting new help on the battlefield, receiving hundreds of combat drones from Iran planning to use them in Ukraine, which has also had its own success using drones. Meanwhile, inspectors with the International Atomic Energy Agency arrived in Kyiv, making their way to the Russian-held Zaporizhia nuclear plant tomorrow to assess safety at the plant, where there are fears nearby attacks could spark a nuclear disaster. Both Russia and Ukraine blaming each other for the recent violence there. You cannot have a military occupying the power plant. Today, we spoke to U.S. Senators Rob Portman and Amy Klobuchar, here to show bipartisan support for Ukraine. This is all about nuclear safety, um, and that would make a big difference uh, to get this area off of the wartime grid and back in the hands of those that know how to run it. The European Union is now sending some 5 million iodine tablets to residents in the area as a way of possibly protecting them from some forms of radiation as these people are bracing for the worst case scenario. Tom? Okay, Megan Fitzgerald for us. Megan, we thank you. And Russia's oil industry, seen an unexpected boom since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. A new report in the Wall Street Journal revealing that the country is finding demand from new buyers in the Middle East and Asia to offset the U.S. and Europe's economic sanctions. I want to bring in Surya Jayanti. She's an Eastern European energy policy expert and formerly a U.S. diplomat, serving also at the energy chief as the energy chief to Kyiv. Uh, from 2018 and the International Energy Council at the U.S. Department of Commerce. All right, so Surya, explain to our viewers how with all that tough talk and sanctions from President Biden and other European allies, how, according to the Wall Street Journal, has Russia began been able to, to actually make almost $5 billion more this year? So the san sanctions package was, of course, unprecedented, but it did exclude energy and quite intentionally. And energy has only been brought in in subsequent sanctions package. And that's partly because Europe wasn't ready to wean itself off of Russian energy. And we've seen that play out in the numbers. In fact, a recent document leaked from within the Russian government suggests that it's expecting a 38 percent increase in revenues just from energy exports this year. Partly that's because Europe has not been ready, but that's also because they've managed to find other buyers around the world, namely China, of course, and India, which didn't import any Russian oil until the invasion and now imports an awful lot. How hard is it to actually trace that Russian oil? As the Wall Street Journal article points out, there are swaps that happen on the open ocean where barrels are changed and buyers may be buying Russian oil without even knowing it or at least acting like they don't know. It's certainly a problem. It's very difficult to tra trace oil from its origins all the way through to its distribution points. 
A lot of it does happen on the open sea. A lot of it happens at mixing centers. And much like the fish trade, you're never quite sure whether what you're actually getting is halibut. The same is true with crude. It's very hard to trace. You can break it down by its chemical properties, but once you start mixing, for example, the sulfur con content becomes something that can be matched with, with blends that, that can hide its origin. But this boom for Russia, this wartime boom, it could be over by next year? I doubt it. I think that uh, it's a bit optimistic to think that the world will lose its appetite for Russian oil and natural gas by next year. To start with, for example, Europe is in fact increasing 22, has increased by 22 percent the amount of diesel it's importing from Russia just since July. And so although overall uh, energy imports are down by 15 percent, there's actually an increase in the amount being paid, and nobody is quite ready to switch off the taps, except well, apparently Putin. We're running out of time here, but what is one thing either President Biden can do or European allies that will actually hurt Russia going forward? Well, Western powers are considering price caps, which would be a way of preventing there being too much of a shortage of fossil fuels in the market, which would then increase prices even higher than the record prices that we're currently seeing. Price caps would be a way of limiting the amount of money Russia gets for the oil without actually limiting amount, the amount of oil itself. Surya Gianti, we thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. When we come back, our team sitting down with one woman who says her boss used her immigration status to take advantage of her, how she's now fighting back in court. Stay with us. Now to the Americas, and we turn our focus to an often unseen issue affecting undocumented people across the country. Many of them afraid to report abuse or any type of crimes, really, out of fear of deportation. NBC's Julia Ainsley sat down with one woman who says her immigration status left her vulnerable in the face of horrific abuse from her boss. And now six years later, she's finally getting her day in court. We do want to warn you, the details of the story may be difficult to hear. Beneath the lights of the Las Vegas Strip, Sandra Perez found work inside the Monte Carlo in the food court at Sabaro in 2016, a time in her life when she says she was desperate for work. Yes, Imaya, you're looking for a job anywhere? She was an undocumented migrant from Mexico, just out of an abusive marriage with a family to support. Her manager, Zachary Sabayas, hired various members across Sandra's family, knowing they were undocumented, Perez says. Several weeks after starting work, Perez says the unthinkable happened in the walk-in cooler. He forced me. Uh, he took me to the walk-in, and he forced me. And it was, I just, my body, my mind freeze, because it wasn't supposed to happen on my job. Perez is now alleging in a federal lawsuit that the rape continued weekly, totaling over 20 times, despite her saying no and trying to fight. In court filing, Sabias admits to having sex with her in the cooler, but maintains the relationship was consensual. But her allegations are not uncommon. Ms. Perez's case is among the most horrific stories, the most horrific accounts I've ever experienced. I've worked uh, for more than two decades with immigrant communities, victims of uh, hate violence, uh, domestic violence. And this is just such a horrific case of what she has gone through in the workplace. Immigration law expert Greg Chin says there's no real way to know how many migrants often don't report harassment in jobs they cannot leave. If people like her are targeted uh, because they are afraid that they'll lose immigration status, or in her case, that they'll be deported because she doesn't have status, uh, that is not good for the country. Uh, and that's why Congress should really act and legalize uh, immigrants and provide uh, legal status for them. Sandra says it was at a Sabaro inside this building, what used to be the Monte Carlo Resort, where the weekly assaults happened. Threatening with uh, deporting me, you want me to call immigration? You better you start walking. Her lawsuit said the attacks continued for five months before she was transferred to another Sabara location. Did you feel you had any other choice? Yes, I feel like I don't have no choice. <laughs> Not even when they say I have a choice. No, when you are illegal. No, when you are illegal, you don't have a choice. 
Three months after Perez was transferred, she filed a complaint against Sabayas with Sabaro, the Nevada Equal Rights Commission, and the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. The commission found probable cause to support Perez's charge of sex discrimination and harassment and provided their report to the court. Sabayas's lawyer says the police have yet to contact his client. Even how much I believe in the law, it is hard because, no, we don't even know what is going to happen. We don't even know uh, is, if he's going to jail. Years later, Perez obtained a green card through marriage, allowing her to legally live and work inside the United States. And she says that with no fear of being deported, she decided to sue both Sabayas and Sabaro for $178 million, arguing the company mishandled her claims. Lawyers for Sabaro argued Perez failed to take advantage of the company's complaint procedure and that when she did come forward, they acted seriously, quickly and promptly to investigate her claims. In a statement, Sabaro denies her claims about the company's handling of her allegations. They said Perez, quote, refused to cooperate with the investigation. Instead, she pursued legal action, which has persisted over the past several years. Sandra, like a lot of undocumented people out there, think they have no recourse, that there's no one's going to listen to them. She was told over and over that no one was going to believe her. Dee Sol and Jenny Foley are representing Perez in court, a trial that began in Las Vegas last week. When she first saw Zachary in the courtroom, she turned around to get out of the courtroom, and she sat down on a bench outside where she was sobbing emphatically. Outside of court, Perez says she is trying to get back on her feet. She since has a new job and a new restaurant, a fresh opportunity still filled with old triggers. What would you tell other women, undocumented women, who find themselves in that same position? To say something, to don't be scared. It is hard because I never thought he's going to be the hardest. And Julia Ainsley joins us now from Washington. Julia, the allegations in this piece, they're, they're, they're just terrible. And, and I want to go back to a point the immigration attorney brought up in your piece. I know it's difficult to put a number on the individuals who might not be reporting crimes like those that Sandra describes. But what kind of protections exist for undocumented migrants? Because a lot of times they're living in fear or they're living in shadows. That's right, Tom. Many might be living in the shadows that we won't ever know about, but there is a special protection called a U visa. That is specifically in place for migrants who claim to be victims of serious crimes inside the United States. They could get a U visa that would allow them to then live and work in the United States. But Congress only allows for about 10,000 U visas to be granted per year. And as Greg Chin told me, about t two to three times that number apply for a U visa every year. So at least 20 to 30,000 are claiming to be victims of these very serious crimes, and there simply aren't enough visas to go around to protect them all. So you mentioned the U visas and also the people that are, I guess, are in the queue waiting to get a U visa, but you have to go through an incident or endure some type of trauma, right, in order to qualify for this option. What about protections just for migrants to, to make sure it never reaches that point? Do they have any avenue? Well, under this administration, the Biden administration has really made it a low priority to deport anyone who is in a national security risk or who hasn't recently entered the United States. So someone who's a victim of a crime should feel safe, they say, going to law enforcement and reporting that crime, whether they're the victim or a witness to a crime, something law enforcement asks immigrant communities to do all the time, to cooperate with them and to come out of the shadows. And Sanders' advice to undocumented women who might be victims of crimes is not to stay silent but to come forward and report abuse. And very brave of her to come forward on, on this type of platform and talk to you and share her story, because that's not easy. Okay, Julia Ainsley tonight, her and her team with an incredible report. We do appreciate it, and we'll be right back. Finally tonight, the back-to-school surprise. As kids head back to school across the country, one second grader in Kentucky got an extra boost from a very special guest. Okay, let's see who's ready. Thank you, Isaiah. At Huntsville Elementary in central Kentucky, a lesson on the Bill of Rights. They worried that it did not include basic freedoms. Second grader Luke Johnson knows protecting those freedoms goes beyond just a civics lesson. He's been gone since I was in first grade. 
His dad, Chris, away on a deployment, serving with the National Guard in Texas. He goes to the Army, but he don't fight. He's not fighting, but he... And he's also fixing, fixing planes and helicopters. Luke and Chris stay in contact via phone calls and FaceTime, but Luke still misses his dad a lot. On a scale of 10, 10 out of 10, it's 10. It just gets to me that I have to watch him grow up through a phone at times, and, and you feel like you have to put your life on hold when you go away. Last Christmas, Luke's class sent over care packages and Christmas cards to his dad's unit. Those cards proudly displayed on the tail rotor of one of their helicopters. So when Chris had an opportunity to go back home for a few days, he decided to visit Luke at school. I had not planned for it to be a surprise. Things just lined up at the perfect moment. In the corner of my eye, I saw him. Um, I just ran up and gave him a hug. Luke's reaction reminding Chris of another family member he used to surprise. My mom passed away a couple years ago, and I, I'd been gone before, and I got to surprise her when I come home. And the squeal that he did was the same squeal that she did when she seen me. For this class, not just a thank you for those cards and care packages. They loved all the cards and all the goodies that they got. But a real life lesson on service and sacrifice. And a big shout out to our station, WLEX, for their help on that story. We also want to thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.